anyway. Um, so I will make an announcement on Piazza and correspondingly some of the tutorial times has also been swapped. That's why tutorial sign up has not opened yet, but it will open soon. Um, so stay tuned on Piazza. Um, right, yes, future lectures of we meet Monday at noon rather than 2 p.m. Um, so the way tutorial sign up will work is that the head tutors, Alex or Shamin, will announce it. They will give people a lead time. For example, if the sign up op opens tomorrow noon, you will probably get to know later today. Um, to give up people some prep time to make sure you get on it. We'll have a look at the timetable. Uh, we will, it looks like we will have to open all tutorial slots and uh, which one you like, and there uh, the sign up is done on Wattle. Right, so the Piazza post will have all that information for you. Hope you will be happy about that. Um, and hopefully everybody can get a tutorial. So about 40% of the tutorial capacity will be in person. So tutors have discussed this and they're all happy to meet with you guys in person and talk wearing masks. Um, hopefully everybody stays safe and do a good chunk of learning there. Um, in terms of in-person lectures, if you've been checking the course schedule, I've added a placeholder there. So a condition on I'm able to find a room that's big enough to fit the on-campus population who are really like who are willing to come. Uh, we will be meeting the week, the Wednesday after Canberra Day holiday. Um, so I am not currently considering transferring the, all of the lectures to in person because uh, my primary focus is to deliver you the content in a way that's accessible to 300 students. Unfortunately, dual delivery right, right now in real time, basically allowing the half of the people who are still overseas and the other half who are on campus to have a good experience in real time is I consider that not a problem that's already been solved. Uh, maybe other lecturers have had good, um, I guess, better experiences. I will learn from them throughout the semester. But for now, um, I'm prepared to do one in-person session the first half of the semester. And if there is no change in the logistics and we um, constraints or COVID regulations, maybe do another one in the second half of the semester. Or maybe two, we could also, like as you can see, the la very last lecture slot is a blank slot. If people want to, I can turn up, turn up for Q&A or walkthroughs in that spot as well. So I do hope to meet a considerable number of you in person and fingers crossed that we can make this happen um, and make all the logistics work. Um, so there's that. Um, uh, right, assignment one, very important, uh, is re being released soon, um, which leads me to the next slide. What we're going to talk about will be useful, well, today will be useful for assignment one. Um, I would, we will probably do a walkthrough of assignment one next week in after either of the lectures and it will be recorded. Um, but for now, I can give people a heads, heads up in the sense that assignment one is not a piece of cake, right? Um, so you're expected to do some new math um, using some of the skills you obtained in the lecture mm -hmm. in the first um, three to four weeks of the lectures to reason about uh, models that are slightly different than what we're talking about. Uh, in particular, there is exponential family um, distributions plays a role there. Um, right, binomial also plays a role there, a well, much smaller role, but nonetheless at all. Um, and hopefully by releasing assignment one, we will achieve two things. A, um, allow you to start early, and B, um, allow you to assess whether you're up 
like you want to sign up to the rest of this class or not because we're still in week one. Um, if you do decide it looks too difficult, so there are two ways to think about this, right? So if assignment one looks difficult, but after roughly five weeks of studying in this class, we expect most of this class being able to do it, which means there is a significant perceived gain in ability for you to mathematically reason about machine learning models, which is great. So uh, yeah, buckle up and let's like go for the ride. Um, on the other hand, if you don't have to take this class um, and you're thinking about dropping this class, this is also a good time. No offense taken whatsoever. OK, so here's what we're going to talk about today, really. Um, we are going to start from like an easy place, machine learning for curve You have probably, a lot of you would have taken the prereqs. Uh, you will say, well, regression, who doesn't know? You, you have taken statistics. Um, it's one of the staples. But we will introduce in the way that connects, that ties together a number of key machine learning concepts, such as what is a model, what are losses and error functions, what are overfitting, um, what are regularizations, and moreover, how do you do model selection? And then we also tie to get, tie this to the probabilistic view of regression. Basically, how do you do maximum likelihood fitting? And if we have been used to, some of you may have been used to, um, yeah, minimizing these squares. What is the so? What is the probabilistic interpretation of that, which we will cover in this um, next block? Um, right. Um, we'll talk about, yeah, briefly brush you up on probabilities, uh, which most of you may know. Um, and we'll introduce that through one dimension, fitting to one dimensional Gaussians. And then we'll walk you through some of the key geometric intuitions of multi dimensional Gaussians. Um, and then we'll talk about exponential family at the end. Hopefully there is enough time left. If not, we'll talk about it like next time. Um, right, so there's that. And the content that we're covering, I wanted to say a word or two about the first two chapters of um, the book, the textbook, PRML. Uh, basically, um, this part in red, we will cover today, along with part of the Gaussian distribution, exponential family. Right, so and then so I would say these two chapters are quite key and they contain many useful concepts that are referred to throughout the semester. So did the appendix, right? So um, and then so in in later lectures, we will cover curse of dimensionality, decision theory, sum of decision theory, information theory, um, condition and marginal Gaussians. Um, yeah, this block. And also curse kernel density estimates and nearest neighbor in the kernel section. Um, in the past, we don't cover, they are still useful. Um, so. I encourage to, you to read the first two chapters. So let's start from uh, what we mentioned yesterday. So machine learning is defined with respect to three things. Experience E, data, task T, targets, um, and the nature of the tasks, and also performance measure P. So let's make all of them quite concrete. Um, and do so with some toy data. You might think sinusoids are not the most exciting machine learning data you've seen. Um, I would agree, but at the end of this lecture, I do have an argument about why we should care. So hope you stay with me until then. So let's first generate some artificial data, basically sine of 2 pi x, um, which is a one-dimensional input, one-dimensional output function, plus some random noise. Uh, so sine of 2 pi x is the green curve. The uh, the data points are basically this function plus random noise, let's say I, the Gaussian noise, which uh, translates to these 10 data points on the screen, they're in blue circles. Right? 
So what the machine sees are only the blue circles. It tries to guess where the green curve is. Um, so in this case, n number of data points is equals to 10. Uh, we write like, so throughout this book, um, yeah, vectors or matrices are sometimes blue. Bold. Um, oh, there's a question saying whether I've shared your screen. I think the answer is yes. Um, because I'm using two screens and I can see one screen from the other. If you can't see it, um, it's probably because something on your end, right? So, um, so we have X's as the inputs here, uh, T as the targets, outputs, the Y axis. Um, there are both 10 numbers, X and T are both in the real space. So we know polynomials are good things. Um, so it has many other functions. So let's say we want to fit an M's order polynomial to describe this unknown underlying function from these 10 points. Um, and we basically parameterize this M's order polynomial with a wave vector W. Um, right, from um, elementary algebra, we know that the MS, M solder polynomial involving one scalar variable is written like this, right? And there's a constant term, and then there is one W for each order of polynomial. We can write them in summation form um, like this, uh, noting that it sums from zero. Right, so these are very straightforward. Um, as we can clearly see, these are not a straight line, so M had better be greater than one. So we talked about the task um, T, um, the target, the data point. We haven't talked about performance measure P, but. So here is one concrete instance of performance measure P that some of you might, would have seen in statistics or IML, which are these squares. So uh, we take, basically it's a sum of the differences of the function that we're trying to estimate. This is what machine learning will learn, the y of x comma w function. Um, take the difference between that and the target variable, square them and sum them up. The one or half in front is for like, it's good to have when we're differentiating. But, um, if you've done exam, well, any differentiation recently on quadratic functions, you know what we mean. Um, and gr graphically what this means is that suppose we draw the function that we're learning as a red curve, um, the error, error term here, error term inside of each summation term is basically the size um, or the height of how far Tn is from the nearest point in Y, or actually the, the point of the same X on Y. So what we're computing are basically the sum of, or the average um, squared lengths of these green stems, which are the error terms. So assume we can do some fitting. We haven't talked about that part yet, but assume there is like a software package that someone else wrote that could do poly polynomial fitting. There's plenty of them now uh, out there, scikit-learn and so on. But um, now we can play with the polynomial order n. We just said that, yeah, one seemed to be not enough, but we haven't said how, like what is m. So let's just try a range of different m's. Um, so in here we have m equal to zero, well, we just fit the constant term, it fits the mean, okay, data, mean of the data. If we fit a line, it looks like this. Um, if we fit m equals three, it's actually pretty good um, looking. It looks like a sinusoid because we know the branches were cheating here. Um, it, we can also fit a higher order polynomial. We know that um, polynomials have universal representation power, meaning that if we're allowed to use any other polynomial, we can represent any curve 
um, on the real line. Uh, if we fit a polynomial of order 10, here's what happens. So it passes through each of the 10 data points exactly. And of course, this is the case from like algebra, you know that if we fit a polynomial of order x, um, um, x or less, less than x data points, we're going to fit exactly. Um, and for example, the polynomial order three don't fit all data exactly, but it sort of sort of passes through, cuts through the data, right? Um, so perfect fitting is nice. What's unsatisfying on this particular plot is what's going on here and here, meaning that the fitted polynomial blows up or um, like in a positive or negative direction. Um, because we know the ground truth, we know that the ground, uh, the t value of t, the target var variable, is actually bounded. But the outcome of the learned function is not bounded, which is a problem. So how do we grapple with this phenomena, right? So uh, we're going to talk about a few commonly used tools today, some of which you would have heard, some might be new. Um, the first tool is called learning curves. Very useful. If you do a machine learning research project, the first few things you do is to generate learning curves or different learning curves for the tasks that you're tackling. If you're trying to reproduce somebody else's paper, generate learning curves to get more insight into how the algorithm works because um, it exposes interesting details that's not always in the paper or in a high level description, right? Let's say we are still dealing with these 10 training points. Now we also have access to a test set of 100 points. The point about this test set is that they are separate. So uh, it's like, right, take, we learn on the 10 points and then we take a test, just like what we're doing in a class like this. Um, the test problems, and in this case, data points are unseen. So a learning curve is basically, um, the y-axis is usually performance measure P. Um, you can use different performance measure for the same task as well, but just let's say for, for because we've used root mean square error, let's just use that. Uh, root mean square error is basically the yeah, square <laughs> error, uh, like take take the square root of the metric we saw a few uh, pages ago, right? The axis axis here because we're wondering about polynomial order m is m. What we can see is that on the training and test sets, the trends are different, right? So there seem to be a sweet spot between polynomial of order three to about eight. Before that, the training error is higher, basically the, the blue lines, and the test error is also high. And after that, this is what's interesting. Um, the training error goes down to zero due to the algebraic reason we mentioned, but test error goes up by a lot, uh, which results from, for example, these regions where things are un become unbounded or have spikes where it's imagining spikes when no, nothing exists. Um, and you probably, uh, if you have encountered machine learning before, so we can say that in this area it's overfitted, right? Overfitting happens. Um, we will break down overfitting a few times throughout the course uh, in the generalization lecture that is new this year and also in regression next week. We ask us, what does it mean? Like, why is there overfitting? Right? We can. It's in, because these are polynomial fittings. Um, we can actually stare at the coefficients, resulting coefficients, and ask ourselves so why. There's a typo here from the book. It's um, so and polynomials of um, order zero, one, three, and nine. Uh, and here are all the coefficients. We can see that the coefficients are mostly fairly small. <laughs> like sometimes eyeballing numbers is a very useful exercise. Eyeballing data is an even more useful exercise. 
Um, so in this case, um, especially when something goes wrong, right, you go under the hood and eyeball some numbers. And here, um, as we said, the target function is sine of x and t is bounded. Um, why are these coefficients so big? Okay, I see there is a hand being raised. Um, but people want to just unmute and ask a question. Nope. Um, if not, I'll pause across in between sections and ask for questions. Um, right, so this is another side of the phenomena of the overcompleting question, right? So the, the first phenomena we spotted was the drastic increase in test error. The second phenomena is um, basically all the co coefficients become very large, um, which intuitively does explain the spikiness of the other time phenomena polynomial. So if we, um, let's say we cure the symptom and not the cause for now. Um, one way, one thing that machine learners do is to regularize, right? An L2 regularizer is very popular. If you're taking one of the, um, I guess, other courses that uses deep learning, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with it, or if you've used PyTorch, um, like just throwing an auto regularizer on the net, um, it probably will make things better in a lot of ways. But that's also not the only cure, right? So one cure you can think about is, hey, we only have 10 data points. How about let's have more, right? If we increase 10 to 15, then the polynomial looks a bit nicer and it's no longer blowing up um, in the regions we don't want. And if we um, yeah, increase the number of data points, the blue circles to 100, it actually fits the original green function pretty well. You, I mean, order 10 polynomial. Right. So that's the first cure. If we can obtain more data, that seems to be a good idea. We will talk about why that's a good idea in the theory slash generation. So here's the regularization trick. Um, so instead of minimizing the square error, we now add what's commonly known as the regularization term. We say, well, W is becoming too big. Um, Let's penalize W that has like a magnitude that's too big. We don't know how much to penalize it with respect to the uh, square error. So in fact, actually this, in, if you use something like this, um, you will want to normalize this sum of square error by M because you want the regularization strength to be invariant to the number of data points you have as well. Um, so that's a common trick. But anyway, so this is uh, so this is commonly called a hyperparameter. Again, so it's not the parameter W um, that we learn, but it's an additional parameter that governs the behavior of W. Um, so the grounds for this will be covered in Bayesian regression in week two, but let's assume we do this for now. So there's a couple of questions coming in um, about why bigger coefficients are bad, um, because in real data sets, um, our data, we can always sort of normalize it or bound it so that the input and output are both bounded usually. Or you can, let's say, um, Z normalize it so that it's like zero mean and univariance. Uh, if W is too big in that case, that means the output is not bounded. And that's bad. Like in the training data, the output cannot, we can also bound the output by pre normalizing it, right? Um, I hope that answers the question. Um, and then, why more data has better generation? Um, 
it pertains how much like how well we're estimating the underlying function and um, doing so from more data means lower variance. I haven't defined variance precisely, which we will do. Um, so, okay, let me try this, right? So the, the explanation that makes sense now is that if we're trying to estimate an underlying distribution, which we invariably are in this class, depending, no matter how complex the model is, more data is always um, better, more data and evidence will lead to more reliable estimates. So it's um, informally, this amounts to more learning, more evidence. Um, I hope that's somewhat convincing. If you have taken statistics, you will know that the estimate, like you can formally quantify that. If you have not, maybe just take my word for now as for, yeah, more data is more learning. Um, so that's a good idea. Um, yes, there's a question about dividing by one over two n or one over n. So in fact, it does not matter as long as we're consistent because in the error function like this, um, like if the normalizing factor on the front is order of um, two different, um, then um, like it's equivalent to a lambda that's also a factor of two different. Um, I hope that makes some sense. Uh, in reality, we want the one over two in front because it's easier or the one over two vanishes after we differentiate this square term. And that's nice. Okay, so um, what we have made uh, said so far is, hey, let's, let's, let's try some lambdas and see if that helps solve our overfitting problem or the like blowing up a uh, fitted function blowing up problem on this toy data set of 10 points. Um, so instead of reasoning about lambda, the book says, well, it's a good idea to reason about log of lambda or the order of magnitude of lambda. Um, because when we do trade-offs like this, it's usually the order of magnitude matters and not when, for example, lambda is 0.5 or 0.6, that matters. It's, Okay, if you take my word for that, then uh, we plug in log of lambda in close minus 18, so which is a small, very small, fairly small lambda. And lambda equals one, log of lambda equals zero, right? So if we put lambda equals one, uh, meaning, well, if we stare at equation 1.4, that means equal weight for both terms. Um, and in this particular case, n equals 10, so the first term might be pretty small, then this almost result in something similar to a straight line or a flat line with like no linear term at all. So this, this regulation, lambda equals one, might be too strong. And this log of lambda equals minus 18 looks somewhere in the right neighborhood, right? Um, so where does this lead us? Um, so instead of directly reasoning about M, the order of uh, polynomials, now we are reasoning about lambda, uh, which is a hyperparameter in the smooth and differentiable function. Um, so as I hinted, um, the learning curve is a good tool to help us reason about this. So here's the learning curve about log of lambda. So before the last learning curve we saw was um, about M, right? So E of RMS, the Y axis is the same and the X axis is different. In here, um, as you can see, the, we want both training and test error to be low. Um, and the sweet spot is around this region. And after that, both training and test error rises. Uh, I forgot the details, maybe this underlying 
uh, model is still fit, fitting the other 10 polynomial. That's why the train error also arises. But what happens here is that if we um, again oh, apply the eyeball test on the coefficients, so log of lambda equals minor infinity equals no regularization. So these are the coefficients we were st staring at before. So they are still big. Um, so once we add a small lambda, like, like e to the minus 18 is quite a lot. It's about 10 to the 6 or something like that. Um, the coefficients already become a lot more well behaved. I <laughs> right? And and here, um, the coefficients seem to be too small, and they are all around zero. Uh, yeah, so in here, regularization might be too strong. So learning curves are a good way to eyeball and choose a hyperparameter like that if you have like only one or a handful of hyperparameters. Um, and there's a reason why these are around zero, um, we, which we will talk about next week. Oh. So what we've talked about is model selection in, like essentially with test data actually. So we've said this, there are um, 10 data points for training and then 100 data points for testing. One of the previous slides, if you still remember. But in, in practice, you should never do that, right? Because uh, that means we're cheating on the exam, which is not good. So the exam or, or the real test should test for generalizations should always be new. Um, what we also learned is that minimizing square error or data likelihood as we will see, it can be a poor indication of the performance on new data. Like basically the two lines uh, on the previous page uh, of errors on the training and test data, they don't move together. They sort of like error on the test data drops and then rises. Um, so we definitely should preserve the sanity or the integrity of test data. This is one of the, I guess, uh, peaking on test data is one of the cardinal things of machine learning, if you will. Um, so let's not do that. Um, there is an intuitive and formal notion of what's called model complexity that governs things like polynomial curve fitting. In this case, we can take the like order of the polynomial M as a surrogate for model complexity. Um, the like given a sufficiently large and uh, uh, regularization parameter lambda also governs model complexity. So there's a large literature about model complexities in machine learning. Um, we won't delve, dive into them here. Um, you could write entire PhD thesis on it still if you want. Uh, we might give you a flavor in the in the generalization lecture. Right. So what um, what we're talking about is basically this picture. Um, so far, we've looked at training set, training and test error. But what you really want when you apply machine learning models, right? So what we're talking about in this slide and the next one is the empirical view, right? Given that we should, shouldn't should peak and cheat on test data, what should we do? Um, so what we should do is called cross-validation. Um, before we talk about the cross path, let's just talk about validation. Um, we can have practice exams, right, or quizzes in order to prepare ourselves for the formal exam. So in machine learning, it's the same notion here. We can essentially partition the training set and use validation set to estimate how well the generation is, or even choose some of the hyperparameters. So for people who are or have taken computer vision or any of the other classes that use large neural networks, you should be familiar with this practice, right? You always have a training portion, validation and test. The cross path of cross validation comes when we ask or how reliable are the estimates we obtain from the validation set on generalization performance? Um, right, because let's assume we have a sufficiently somewhat large data set. Um, and as we 
intuitively drawn, it's usually assumed that the hyperparameters are a few and far between. Or you have, we have uh, only a handful of hyperparameters, but lots of parameters to learn in the training set. Therefore, we allocate most of the data to the training set and we estimate performance on the validation set. Again, um, it's a small, if validation, the sample size of validation set is small, the estimate are going to be like to have larger variance or be somewhat noisy. Um, how much can we trust it if we only do this once, right? The answer is, well, it depends. Again, in current conversion um, or large natural language data sets, um, a lot of people just uh, have one validation fault as the estimate. But bear in mind that's just one estimate out of a like, small ish sample, right? Um, the, there is a mitigation to that, which is basically rotate um, the validation and test portions of our data as well. So if we have, let's say there are two scenarios, if we have test sets that are essentially held out data that we cannot touch or don't have access to, let's say web traffic from tomorrow or next year, then we cannot report performance on the test data. What we can do is to estimate performance on validation data, right? Train from last month, uh, validate on this month, right? Um, and maybe rotate through, maybe train from this year and then validate on the data from last year um, in order to estimate generation performance. Um, so what? So this schematic from the book 1.18 um, basically says if our data are IID generated to are assumed to be IID, we can do um, cross validation by essentially partition the data into S well, it's usually called k fold validation, k equal folds, and then use one fold for, let's say, validation and the rest for training, and rotate through. This is usually assumed when you see pictures like this one below from the MML textbook and um, elsewhere. Um, when you see one bar for training data and then one dotted bar for validation, it's assumed that if you want more reliable estimates and have the time and computational power to do so, you rot rotate it through. Um, that way you get better and more reliable estimates. Uh, if you need to, for example, report generalization or test data performance on the same data set, it's also assumed that uh, you do what's called double loop cross validation. Basically, rotate the validation for through through this portion, this all training data portion, and then um, and then also use different portions of the label data as test data and then average the performance. So if you read uh, a machine learning paper that says I test my algorithm on UCI adult data set, one of the like widely used and well known like toy ish data sets, um, I use five go cross validation. This is um, on this double loop, usually cross validation scheme. Uh, surprisingly, so at the time of writing of the MML book, or actually a few years before, I think uh, Ching Song, one of the authors, and um, have been collaborating locally a lot on this topic, and we always sort of lamented that nobody writes about it until he finally did in the MML book, which is which is nice. Yeah. Um, the later latest two questions coming on teams. Yes, for for, for cross validation for each of these rows, you essentially need to train the model uh, separately. Moreover, there's um, moreover if you are selecting hyperparameters using, for example, the four four cross validation, um, then after that you might want to train the model again if you want to use all the training data you want to. For example, we're selecting lambda, and now we decided lambda log of lambda is minus ten. Then you use, and you want to use all of the training data. Then you need to train a model again using all of this white and red data combined um, with lambda equals minus ten, and that might give you a better shot on generalizing them even better because now you you have a bit more training data. Uh, but if you have loads and loads of training data, 
like some of the deep learning applications, like the other comment says, in current deep learning cross validation is not too common anymore, but at least you should have validation. But, um, I hope that makes sense. All right, so what we did so far, uh, it's basically curve fitting, model selection, loss functions, and overfitting and regularization. Uh, is there any questions? If not, we'll move on to probabilities for the rest of this section. We're roughly exactly 45 minutes in. Um, so, okay. Maybe we'll like actually have time to get through a lot of probabilities. So let's start from some really simple stuff. Um, some of you would have seen in high school or university for week class or even counting coin tossing and so on. So um, there are two key rules of probability that we will invoke again and again. Uh, the sum rule, well, let's say that in this slide, the example is a discrete probability table of two random variables, x and y, that x takes um, five different values. Okay, so x is has one, two, three, four, five, and y takes three different values, one, two, or three. Let's come, come across, but and um, what are the um? So let's say you we partition the entire population into age buckets. Let's say five age buckets um, and let's say income brackets. Yeah. And then we count. Um, for example, for the whole population of Canberra, we put um, everyone has a place in this two dimensional space and we just count how many people are in each cell. Um, let me see if I can bookmark a question. No, so I will maybe cover this part first and then come back and address the fine tune versus the <laughs> retrain question. Thanks for that. Um, right, so count. Um, so we essentially have counts, NIJ, um, it's number of people with X value I and Y value J. And we can compute, um, for example, P of X I, um, assuming we have a big N number of samples, people, say in Canberra, P of X I, or more formally, if P of big X, the random variable equals the value small X I is the count of, um, or actually, the row, mm, let's say, the column sum, ci, over the n number of samples. Um, and this, according to the sum rule, or intuitively, this is equal to um, n in front, basically n i j plus j goes from one. Meaning, if I ci is represent the columns up, hopefully that's pretty intuitive. Um, and the product rule basically says um, the joint probability is equal to the product of the conditional and the marginal, which we will get to in base rule. Okay, so here's base zero, which is the product rule written twice and with the term moved around. What does that mean? The conditional probability of y given x. Um, yeah, if we want to flip the way the conditioning is done, we basically multiply by the one marginal and divide by another. Um, 
So in this particular case, the grid is like the one we, we saw in the last page, except the underlying data may be continuous and we just bin them. Right? And then um, the illustration here I think is very helpful. Um, the marginal probability of P of Y is basically sum of number of data points in each column, and P of X is sum of data points in each column here. And it's worth noticing that if we do conditional probability of P of X given Y equals one, which is this particular column uh, row, the, the bottom row here, it leads to a different distribution, right? So than the marginal of P of X. Right, so um, what, how this is derived according to Bayes theorem is basically take the joint probability, basically the counts of each cell, and then divide by uh, the P of Y equals one, the bottom bar here. So that's hopefully a review. Um, continuing on for for continuous random variables, um, we could essentially use the same reasoning. Um, where we say P of X is actually the probability proportional. So the probability of X falling in some infinitesimal bucket, right? Um, right, so delta X with delta X approaching zero. Um, what's worth mentioning here is I assume you, uh, uh, most of you would have encountered this, or actually all of you should. Um, then the product, uh, the sum and product rule also applies for continuous probability distributions in the sense that the sum rule is basically replacing the sum with an integration. We can marginalize out one variable from a joint distribution by integrating over it. In this case, we can get rid of Y. Um, and the conditional probability for continuous variables is equally well defined. Um, and yeah, this is it. It's worth noting, uh, maybe it's worth reminding that for continuous PDFs, the value of P of X, or P of Y, and P of X, Y are not bounded. Unlike in the discrete probability table, the whole thing, like the in the joint probability, they should sum to one, right? In the marginal, they should also sum to one. In this case, um, some P of X, Y are just positive. Or, on the, yeah, or zero. So we're still talking about base zero. Why? Because we wanted to talk about them in the language of parameters and data. So on the top is vanilla Bayes theorem, flipping the, um, the direction of the conditionals. Um, if we're talking about a, right, a learning task, such as the curve fitting task we talked about, uh, W is the parameter being learned. Weights um, or parameters. And curly D is data. Or more concretely, um, let's say a set of two poles X and T uh, where I goes from one to and there are N such data points. Um, what does this mean? Right, so in machine learning, we wanted to learn the model or the parameters or a particular distribution given data, right? which is um, like the goal of learning is on the left hand side. Um, and on the right hand side, probability of data given a model or a set of parameters is commonly called the likelihood. And in the Bayesian realm, which we will delve into in different parts of the semester, and it's sort of a, a prominent theme in our textbook, um, P of W is prior. Basically, uh, what do we think W should look like or should not look like before we even see any data? For example, in our curve fitting example, we said we don't want W to, the, the magnitude of W to blow up for good reasons. 
and that is certainly a plot prior. Uh, then you might ask, so this P of D is really weird. What is it? Um, let me just say for um, for most of this class, because we are we will be reasoning about a given set of training data. Um, then once the data is given, um, then this is fixed basically, and it's a it's not a random. Um, then, yeah, so P of D is not random or not a random quantity because data is fixed once data is given. There are cases where we want to reason about like different data Ds when I'll alert me to that in bias variance and generalization. Right, so if we um, so basically, if we are able to ignore the bottom part of this formula, it basically says it's the posterior of the model given data is proportional to the likelihood times prior. So that's a very actionable formula for us to um, design and reason about machine learning, um, the learning and estimation in machine learning in general. Right? So it's, um, I guess, old wine in the new bottle, that's useful. OK, let's do some other review. Um, so, um, so in statistics and probability, we have the terms expectation variance and covariance. Expectation of a random variable in here, we're talking about the random variable of being x, it's this dish, uh, PDF is p of x. And the function we want to estimate the expectation of is f of x. So e of f is basically this. Uh, hopefully this is nothing new. So variance of a function about x. Um, so what need, we need to be a little bit careful about is um, what this expectation is taking over, right? So what's implicitly assumed or spelled out on the right hand side is this is taken over the random variable x with a probability distribution p of x. So similarly here, so if we just look at var of f, it doesn't even have x, but it's also assumed that these expectations are taking over x over p of x, right? Um, you know from probability. Um, um, that the variance is equivalent to expectation of the square of the function minus the square of the expectation of the function. It's a mouthful, but it's an identity that um, anyone encountering variance in the textbook would have encountered. And the reason we're emphasizing what's, what this E is over is that it's often overlooked in a lot of machine learning literature, both in teaching and more, over, more so in research. So we just need to be careful, right? And here are some examples. If we talk about two random variables now that has a joint distribution and each has their marginal distributions, X and Y, we can compute the covariance, which spells itself out as, well, the expected deviation of x from its mean and y from its mean um, like sort of multiply together. And in this particular case, um, the expectation is over uh, jointly over x and y as random variables when they have a joint distribution p of x and y. OK, this is easier. Uh, it gets a little tricky now as if we write an expression like this, we want to take expectation of f implicitly, actually f of x. This is a different implicit assumption. It's f of x because it's inherited from earlier of this page, condition on y. Now what happened? Um, and note that the expectation is only taken over x. Um, so what this translates to, right, when, if, for example, if x is discrete, we use sum rather than integration, is that we look at f of x um, and weight it 
um, by the conditional probability of x given y. So this particular y is um, basically a random variable with a value of y. So the whole expression is a function of it will yield a function of y rather than a number because the expectation is only taken over x. If we do e of x, y, then we can do another like integration of y. So, um, so that's basically the review of expectation variance and covariance. I leave it up to you to say like there's this intriguing point. Um, do all x like distributions we see have a mean variance and and like third over order moment and so on. Um, I would say for most of machine learning, we are used to we're so used to expect uh, distributions that have a mean and variance that we don't usually think about the question. Um, but the answer is actually no. If we have a power law distribution or things like that, um, they. When the power is greater than two, there's no variance. Um, this happens a lot in large and complex systems such as networks uh, and collective behavior, which is my pet research topic. Um, all right. So now let's move back to the familiar and well-behaved land, right? The Gaussian distribution, which we will talk about a lot uh, throughout this class, especially in the first few, few weeks for good reason. Um, again, this is the familiar ga uh, bell curve of one dimensional Gaussian. Uh, there's one random variable x um, distributed with mean of mu um, and standard deviation of sigma. We know that, like, for example, 68% of the probability mass falls within plus and one, minus one sigma from the mean. Um, we also know that. Uh, well, the Gaussian distribution is basically exponential of a quadratic term. Um, and a normalization. Like normalizing term up front. It's worth remembering <laughs> what they are. Um, and this will become useful, like quadratic terms are familiar, right? Okay, um, and then multi-dimensional Gaussians, we then just end up writing it as a matrix where one over sigma squares becomes like the sigma matrix inverse. Um, and the quadratic terms are still quadratic terms. So these are just matrix form quadratic terms. We will work with this for a fair bit over the next few lectures. Um, so let's, yeah. If you're already familiar with manipulating multidimensional Gaussians, don't worry. If you're not, um, then we'll get good at it towards end of next week. I think. Moving on, maximum likelihood. Um, I hope this is also a review item. So basically, um, for univariate Gaussians, if we observe a couple of data points in blue, what is the maximum likelihood estimate of the parameters mu and sigma? Right, okay. Um, so we basically write out the expression of Gaussian distribution as this curly n of xn condition on the two parameters mu and sigma. And if we have n different data points, we just multiply them, right? Like they are drawn ID from the same Gaussian, then the joint probability of the n data points are products of themselves, like each, with each other. So simple enough. Um, and this is called the data likelihood. And we want, well, the thing is, when we write this out, the x's are the random variables. But what we want to do now, um, as a, I guess, refresher for statistics, uh, if you have taken it, um, and for other people, if this is new, this is called data likelihood. Um, and then, 
so these are the variables we want to solve for. Essentially, we want to um, essentially maximize the likelihood by searching over possible mu's in sequence so that we can make this whole term big across all possible values of n. Right? If we make, for example, mu close to one particular one n xn, you, want, you might be far away from all the other xn's and you want to balance that. And the way to do this, uh, because of the exponential term, you know, like the quadratic term inside the exponential term we were talking about, it's handy to take logs. Uh, and that's what we do next. So we, and also because of the product term here, um, taking the log will allow us to turn the product into a sum, which is handy. So uh, I guess a recurring pattern if you're not already used to this is that we like sums. Um, well, once we differentiate sums, just I guess we can take them apart and we like um, quadratic terms. Uh, because one, once we differentiate, they become linear terms, right? So let's do that. Uh, so we take the log. Um, if you inherit the Gaussian expression from last page, that should be in your head, it looks like this. Um, so the quadratic term turns into essentially one over two sigma squared um, with a minus sign in front, sum over uh, the deviation of each data point from mu. And the normalizer term turns into two parts. Again, once we take the log, the product of sigma squares and two pi um, separates. And now, so we'll solve for mu um, in maximum likelihood now, and then we'll deal with sigma in a few slides because we'll take another stab at this. Um, right, so in order to solve for the maximum likelihood, estimate mu, we basically need to, we call this whole likelihood function L, which is function of mu and sigma squared. Let's make that clear. So we want to do the partial derivative of L with respect to mu. That's where we get the MLE. Um, yeah, so let's do that. Let's just eyeball these terms. If we do this, like this term only have, doesn't have mu, so it vanishes. This is constant, it goes away, and we only would need to worry about the first term. Um, right, we, so only inside the sum do mu exist, therefore we just inherit the uh, constant in front. And because each, inside each summation, so terms being summed up, it's quadratic, so we write two, and then each term inside the summation is being differentiated independently. Uh, X and minus mu, so like quadratic becomes linear term, great. And then due to chain rule, we need to, uh, no quadratic anymore. Uh, due to chain rule, we need to differentiate the linear term with respect to mu as well. That leads to minus one. This minus one and then minus one in front cancels. That's what we're left with. So in order for mu to be a maximizer of the likelihood, we need this um, this differentiation to be zero. Now where do that leave us? Right. So the two and two cancels. And sigma squares is actually the same constant. It doesn't matter anymore. Um, what we are left with essentially sum over n from like um, small n to big n, x n, and the mu is a, it doesn't change with respect to each data point, it just comes out. Okay, right, so great. The maximum likelihood solution of mu is simply the average of the data points. Um, that just reconfirms what you knew already, um, hopefully. And this is the kind of deterioration we'll get to do for, fair, for a fair bit in the rest of the class. Okay. Um, so, 
we can do the same thing for sigma squared. Um, actually, if we do the same access exercise, you will tell tell us uh, sigma squared, the unbiased estimate, or the estimate, a maximum likelihood estimate is something like this, x m minus mu of the maximum likelihood mu squared. Um, We'll get to that in a few pages, but for now, trust me. It's worth commenting, especially for those of you who have taken statistics, that maximum likelihood doesn't mean unbiased estimate in a statistical sense. Okay, what does that mean? So in statistics, bias or bias function of an estimator is the difference between the estimated, estimator's expected value and the true value of the parameter. Um, so estimate when the this bias term measured bias term is zero is called unbiased. Um, so in here it's worth noting that bias is a technical term. It does not carry it does not necessarily carry a negative connotation. The pragmatic view in machine learning is that we can actually trade off bias with many other things such as model complexity variance and so on. Right. So it's not necessarily bad. Uh, but it's, we're talking about anyway, if you're in statistics, you would have um, been told that the unbiased estimator for sigma squares is not this one. Um, it is 1 over n minus 1. Um, there are a number of reasons given for this. Basically, um, if you want an intuitive understanding, um, like estimating mu of the max, uh, like the maximum likelihood mu already used up one freedom of um, like degree of freedom in the end data points. And here we would want to instead divide um, sigma squared by one over n minus one rather than n. Um, if you want to compute it um, formally, right? If you take the expectation over the x, which are normally distributed of the maximum likelihood sigma squared, you'll get this, which means um, the maximum likelihood estimate, oh, you raised it, uh, sort of slightly overestimate, uh, actually slightly underestimate the, um, the variance this way. All right. And the book has, um, a, yeah, an illustration about um, how bias arises. Right, so the green curve is a true Gaussian and we're just fitting our Gaussian on two data points, we can imagine these happens, right? Um, we can, if we only have a small number of data points, the fitted Gaussian can be lopsided. So averaged across the three data sets. So, so this slide and the last slides, we no longer assume that data set D is given and fixed. In here, we're looking at three toy data sets. Uh, averaged across the data sets, um, the mean is correct, but the variance is systematically underestimated because the true variance is actually this big, but the estimated variance is actually a lot smaller. So why are we talking about elementary stats and Gaussians? That's because we want to plug it into curve fitting. Um, and the way to think about this is um, now the function we're trying to learn is uh, y of x given w or y of x parameterized by w and it's in red. Um, we know that in curve fitting or learning from real data, there is um, like we want to account for the noise in, in the data that come in, right? And we can, um, yeah, and they're not too restrictive assumptions. We can assume that the noise of the inherent noise of the data, remember when we generated our toy curve fitting on a sinusoid, we just threw Gaussian noise on it. For many real world um, cases, assuming Gaussian noise is not such a bad idea for the reasons of the central limit theorem, which we'll touch on in a bit to remind you. Um, we can assume Gaussian noise, right? Therefore, uh, probability of the true target 
given this y function, um, this fitted function, uh, parameterized by x and w, we can assume that to be a Gaussian. So graphically, uh, what we're looking at is on each value of x, we're looking at the target sitting under a Gaussian distribution around where this red curve is. Right. So the corresponding dot on the right curve is the mean, and then there is a variance standard deviation parameter sigma, and we can also write it like the inverse of the standard deviation as beta. So there are good reasons to write the inverse of standard deviation or the what's called the precision matrix or then called covariance matrix for multidimensional Gaussians, which we will get to. For now, we just say yeah, beta is the inverse of sigma. Uh, it's the inverse of sigma squared. So this is the mental picture. This, you'll see this picture a few times um, this week and next week. And now we wonder, given data, if we run um, least squares, we are able to estimate a value of W, but can we actually estimate beta or sigma squared? Right? Um, so it turns out that the maximum likelihood view will allow us to do this. All right. Um, okay, before we, we go through this slide, which is not too technical, um, most of the things you see, let me address some of the cumulative questions. So um, I'll do bottom up. Why is the one over two sigma squared being eliminated for the maximum likelihood solution? Because um, we only need the partial derivative to be zero. And in this case, um, when we take the partial derivative, um, so okay, sigma is an unknown. But it is fixed. It does mu does not depend on it. Therefore, like if we multiply both sides of this partial derivative being zero with sigma, it goes away. Uh, I hope that helps. All uh, right, there's a comment about p of d likelihood of d appearing in the data set. Right, if for existing data set or for just one given data set, p of d equals one. That I think that is correct. Um, But if we do have multiple data sets, like a handful of data sets, then each of their probabilities fixed, but not, possibly not equal. Um, yes, there's a whole bunch of questions about training from scratch, fine tuning, and so on. Um, I would say that for, for this class, we are dealing with, I guess, this textbook simple situation, or at least for the first half of the class, that we try to learn W from the training data given from like scratch. If you have a pre-trained model and you want to adapt a new W, like or fine tune a new W on top of the existing model, the pre uh, the the set of W that comes from this pre-trained model can be viewed as prior as well if you want to analyze the behavior of your fine tuning process, that is. Um, the other way to think about it is basically online learning, uh, meaning we learn a pre-trained W from a big chunk of data. Now I have a small number of data and I'm just doing like adapting this W on a smaller amount of data, uh, which is governed by, I guess, optimization, um, like online stochastic optimization, SGD, and so on. I hope that helps. Um, and then there is like, so the language of training data validation and generalization will allow you to reason about um, like the different trade-offs of fine tuning versus learning from scratch and how, whether because you, for example, if you're solving a practical task, a computer vision task, it will allow you to reason about how close your validation data is really to your test data and whether fine tuning or learning from scratch is a better idea. Um, yeah, so more data meaning more reliable estimates, but then uh, newer data maybe means that it's closer to your test data, right? So there are these, these different trade-offs that you can play. All right. 
uh, we were here, right? So our goal again is to estimate beta in addition to the parameters W. So let's try and do that. Uh, 1.60, the first line here, we've, we've simply copied the equation from the last page. There's nothing new with this. Probably you tag it. Um, the target distribution follows a Gaussian distribution around the estimated curve with precision parameter beta. Um, and the next line is again nothing new. It just says, oh, over the training data set of n data points, um, there are these two, uh, this NID Gaussian distributions where one for each target and I just multiply them. The next line we've also seen, uh, which is when we, once we see a product of n Gaussians, we take the log and then break them apart. So that's what we did. Uh, now we want to solve for beta. So we do what we just did as well. Um, roughly speaking, maybe, um, yeah, let me not do this. All right. Well, this term vanishes. Um, log of beta, if we differentiate, right, basically if we call this, this term L, um, we compute partial of L, partial of beta. Log of beta goes, turns into one over beta. Um, and oh, good news, the first summation term is actually linear in beta, right? So basically, um, this turns one over half and the sum is the same. Um, so I leave you to do this, to set this to zero and see that, well, the MLE of beta is actually just um, like the MLE of one over beta is the MLE of um, sigma squared. All right. So once we have um, both the estimated parameters W and beta, we can do something like called the predictive distribution, right? What that means is in addition to predicting the function value uh, for an unknown data point, let's say I now observe a data point here or here, um, like if we just do um, least square, minimizing least squares, we will know, well, the expectation of the predictive value is here, right? It's uh, E of T, essentially, um, given the estimates. Um, but now with the beta parameter, we can then say, oh, if we assume beta is the same everywhere, then uh, the confidence interval, or basically the cloud of uncertainty around the predicted curve is this pink tube around this curve, right? Um, this is useful. Because in this, in the case shown here, we know that the red curve is not overlapping with the green curve at times, but actually the cloud of uncertainty around the red curve does in mostly enclose the green curve, meaning that um, like knowing not just the expectation but the uncertainty around a prediction is very useful. Um, all right, we'll, we'll see more of this uh, in Bayesian linear regression and hopefully also in Gaussian processes where the variance at each spot is allowed to change, which is rather interesting. Um, okay. So what we did so far are one-dimensional Gaussians and maximum likelihood estimates and plugging that into curve fitting. Um, let me see if there's any questions so far. Like, is there a reason to obtain the MLE if you already know my um, screen is being cut off? The team is really slow. Oh. oh. Um, well, if we already know the true mean and true variance, then they wouldn't be part of the variables in the likelihood function. Um, if you know that's true and believe it's true, you can just plug it in and obtain hopefully better estimates of something else. I hope that answers the question. 
All right, uh, moving on. Um, before we talk about multidimensional Gaussians, let's take a detour um, and talk about coin flips. These are the simplest distributions possible, uh, but I think notation-wise they are very useful for this class. So let's just go through it. Uh, if we flip a coin, uh, we know it's a bit biased and it's um, heads with probability mu. Um, then this is uh, called a Bernoulli distribution. And we can express the Bernoulli distribution as mu raised to the power of x. In here, x is the outcome of the coin and it's either 0 or 1. And also 1 minus mu raised to the power of 1 point, y minus x. As we can see that x being binary means um, oh, only one of these terms are active at a given time. Uh, the other term is something raised to the power of 0 that goes to 1 and disappears. So this kind of, um, I guess, um, exponentiated representation for binary variables is super useful when we talk about, when we try to express probabilities for classification tasks when x is discrete and binary, um, and possibly multi-hot or one-hot or something, when, like we have many variables. Um, all right, so we can, um, if we generalize from that, if we have a bias coin with probability mu and we toss it big n number of times, um, and the probability, so this is binomial distribution, um, n tosses. The probability of seeing small m number of heads is exactly, um, yeah, n choose m. Uh, times mu raised to the power of m and 1 minus mu raised to the power of m minus m. Um, why is n choose m? Because these small m number of heads can appear in, or like if we number the um, tosses sequentially, they can appear in different places. But also the numbering is permutational sort of invariant, therefore n choose m. Um, Okay, back to Gaussians again. If we so the notation changed a bit because I took this picture from Wikipedia. So p is mu in the last page, and yes, small n is big n um, from the last page. Basically, if we have uh, a subst like a lot of coin tosses in this case, twenty or forty, uh, and we plot the binomial distribution, it looks like discretized. Gaussian. So basically there's a peak around, if let's say, a peak around the expected value of number of heads for p equals 0.5, there's a peak around a half over here and here, right, for n equals 20, it's 10. So if we normalize it, it looks like it's got clear, centered around p, um, we normalize the whole thing to be too low x-axis to between 0 and 1, and then it looks like a Gaussian. Of course, it's not exactly a Gaussian because it doesn't stretch to the negative set of half axis, um, but there's a good reason for that. Right? Central limit theorem, as a reminder, it basically states if we take the sum of a large number of IID variables, then the sum itself tend to be normally distributed. I won't state that too formally. Um, because there are a few different notions about like that that governs like what does tend to be means. But for the purpose of this class, that's why we're not a math department. Um, like for this class, um, and a large portion of machine learning used in CS, it's um, like having that right intuition, like and being able to recognize the phenomena when. Um, for example, lots of different variables are being summed or summarized together. That leads to Gaussians, it's enough. And that this is also the reason why we, assuming regression target distributed distributes around like the prediction um, as a Gaussian is not too bad because in the real world, the noise is probably in the joint force of many different factors that are hopefully independent of each other um, and they add up. 
Um, there's also a note that we will cover when we cover information theory. The Gaussian is a, really a special distribution. It's also the distribution that has the fixed variance and maximum entropy, or define what entropy means at that point, information entropy. Okay, so we're um, so today we are going to run a little bit over, or at least maybe 15 minutes over an hour and a half. Um, so let's first get through the multi-dimensional, two-dimensional Gaussians, and then we see how we go about the exponential family. Um, so let's take another look at Gaussians, in this case two dimensions, and with the matrix notation. Um, I feel right. This this um, these geometric intuitions are quite useful when we reason about multidimensional Gaussians. Right? Therefore, I and it's often not like talked about a lot in the elementary stats class because you don't use it, and not talked about in advanced ML classes because they assume you know. Um, so the simplest case of let's say two dimensional Gaussians is this. Uh, oh, this case. Right, uh, the one on the right where the covariance matrix looks something like a diagonal, but also equal. This is called isotropic Gaussian. Um, the covariance, uh, the standard deviation in each dimension is equal, and moreover, these two dimensions are independent, or they don't correlate with with each other. Right, so the covariance of x1 and x2 is zero. And this is what the different entries in the covariance matrix means, if you need a reminder. Uh, moving gradually to the left, so the next step up is this ellipsoidal covariance uh, contour line. So what, what's drawn here is contours, basically the equal probability lines in the two-dimensional Gaussian, because if we draw it, it will be like a mountain. Um, and here we're just um, looking from the top of the mountain. All right. um, the next step up is we have the covariance matrix are still diagonal, but they're not no longer like scaled version of identity matrix anymore. So we have sigma one and sigma two that are let's like for example, let's designate this to be roughly sigma one, and then this will be sigma two. Okay. Um, X one and X two are still varying independently of each other, and they don't, they are not correlated. But Gaussian variables being independent and not correlated is the same, same thing. Um, for others, not so much. Um, now. Uh, the more general case is um, what I call rotated ellipsoid, which will justify in the next little while. Um, but the covariance matrix is general in two dimensions. It's sigma 1 squared, sigma 2 squared, and then we have sigma 1, 2, and sigma 2, 1. Uh, they are actually equal. Um, In this particular case, um, like sigma one two is greater than zero because when x one increases, x two also increases. So basically, this rotated ellipsoid has sort of a positive slant rather than negative slant. Um, all right. Um, so here is another refresher. Um, like as we said. Um, the quadratic term in the Gaussian distribution, it's this is sort of squared distance, right, um, from the mean for the 1D case. In the 2D case with a general sigma matrix, um, this is called the Mahalanobis distance um, you will see in the literature. What so? Well, Mahalanobis is someone's name. You ask me what it means. So here's what it means. 
um, in well, if you're really familiar with eigenvectors, eigenvalues, um, you probably already know. You might easily derive this. If you need a refresher, here's like let's take a few minutes to walk this through. So what this means is we take the distance of x to the mean vector, and then that's scaled by the inverse of the covariance matrix. Um, so if we do an eigen decomposition of a covariance matrix, um, well, basically, and because the covariance matrix is symmetric, uh, right, so you know, just people reading this later, it's symmetric. Um, By definition, you can derive that from the covariance definition a few pages ago. Um, we can actually do what's an orthogonal decomposition. Basically, lambda, we have all the lambda i's greater or equal to zero. Um, and, and the covariance matrix is also called positive semi definite because lambda are all on a positive semi axis. And the mu i and mu j's, they're orthogonal. Meaning, um, like mu i transpose mu i, so mu i's are the eigenvectors that has unit norm, and then mu i and mu j um, multiply together, or their inner product is zero when i not equal to j. This is what 2.26 means. Um, From the definition of eigenvalues and eigenvectors, um, the covariance matrix itself is nothing but a sum over these rank one matrices, basically the outer product of mu i and mu i itself. Uh, right. So also as a review, um, if you have problem like uh, or if you find the matrix notation not so intuitive, um, you can do this a few times until it's somewhat intuitive, right? So if mu, um, so a ui is a column matrix, then ui transpose ui is basically a row times a column that gives you a number, and the ui times ui transpose, it's basically a column times a row that gives you a matrix. And we scale each of these matrix by lambda um, and sum them together, we get like a matrix the size of sigma. Uh, similarly, well, um, because these UIs are um, also on basis, we can also, um, this makes inver doing inverses of sigma very easy. So this, because matrix inverses are difficult objects, um, but if it's positive semi-definite, we can then just um, inver take the inverse of each eigenvalue when it can be inverted, when it's not zero, that's a tricky bit. Um, and then it follows the same eigen decomposition. It has the same eigenvectors, ui, um, the set of uis. Uh, this is covered in linear algebra. Right. So the Mahalanobis distance, um, square Mahalanobis, Nobis distance. Um, call it delta squared is basically this expression, just copy down here. Um, it translates to, you can really show that it's basically x minus u multiplied by the eigenvector ui. Then what does this mean? Right, so in the next page, it has the geometric intuition. Um, if we line up all the UIs together, these are become matrix multiplies. What, what this means is the original um, coordinates are x1, x2. We essentially rotate the whole, like by computing Mahalanobis distance, we essentially rotate the whole coordinate system into this new set of bases that are orthogonal to each other. They are called U1s and U2s. Um, and the y1 and y2, right, so the distance is capturing um, basically the distance in this rotated and scaled 
um, coordinate. Basically, um, lambda one here is bigger than lambda two, um, but basically things on this same contour line will now consider to have to be to have the same Mahalanobis distance with the mean vector in the rotated coordinate system. Um, that's that. Um, so let's do the following. I will give you a quick um, overview of the exponential family and maybe we will do a little more when we walk through assignment one. Hopefully Monday. Right, so um, the exponential family generalizes what we talked about, like the Bernoulli, the binomial, the Gaussian, and anything else. Um, so the goal of us talking about the exponential family is we want a set of distributions that are more expressive and easy to estimate. Um, the general form of the exponential family, um, the general idea is to have separable components of parameters and random variables. We achieve this in a few different chunks. So in the book, um, it's written out like this. The parameters are etas. Um, the variables are x's transformed by feature function u. Right. So, and this whole term um, is normalized by a function of x, h of x, uh, and g of eta, basically, like some normalizing term. In a lot of, mm, in many distributions that we looked at, h of x is one. So, like the normalizing term only involves the parameters, which is handy. In some important ones, that I don't think we will use in this um, in the in the lecture material. This um, H of X is not one. For example, Prosol. Uh, in your homework question, H of X is one, and it's been rewritten, uh, like reparameterized for a good reason. So you say, well, um, now you just turn this whole thing into an abstract sort of algebra, like um, chain of expressions. Why? Right. So as we will see, um, so basically we can um, reason about normalization by forcing this, like this exponential family expression to integrate one. Um, if x's disappear for a given functional form of g's h and u, um, we can then derive what the normalizer is. Um, let's look at two special cases. For Bernoulli distribution, we can basically manipulate by um, taking logs and exponentiate again because they're inverse function of each other. And um, we get this, right? So this is already looking like what the form is upstairs. So exponential um, of eta x um, times sigma of minus eta where sigma is the sigmoid function. Um, right, and in here, eta is a function of the Bernoulli parameter mu that we talked about. You may say, look, um, Bernoulli is a really simple distribution. Why, why the trouble? Um, there's a few reasons. One is, well, at least this exercise gives us the sigmoid function as a back byproduct. This is one way to derive the sigmoid function, actually. Uh, the other reason is that as you will see, the um, there are nice estimation properties. Like all of the exponential family have one way of being estimated. Once you know that, you can apply it to Bernoulli, Gaussian, um, Parson, and so on and so forth. Right. So what about the familiar Gaussian? Um, so the way to do this is basically to ex expand the quadratic form. And I will spare us of the exercise, but basically the parameter eta are, is a vector of two elements. Uh, u of x, the feature function is now x and x squared. Well, it's quadratic form anyway. Um, h of x is a constant and g of eta is a normalizer that can be expressed using these etas and not the original mu and sigma. These are just manipulations. Um, okay. Assume we can do this. So what is the one thing that going through this trouble gives us? Um, 
remember what you said about this normalization, um, like the expression of exponential forms. So we do this and differentiate um, with respect to the parameter vector eta, as we did a few times for the maximum likelihood estimate. Okay, sure. So we do this. Um, and after some manipulation, um, again, this is, can be left offline, we can convince ourselves that actually the minus uh, gradient of the maximum likelihood estimate of et al, modulated by function g followed by a log, is actually the average of u of x. So that's nice. The right hand side is simple. We know it once we have a data set, we know how to, if we know what u of x, what the feature functions are, we know how to take its average. And that is corresponding to like a function of eta. So that's nice. That gives a way of, as a way of solving for the eta. So maximum likelihood, this expression essentially gives one recipe for doing MLE for all of exponential families. All right. Um, so that is the teaser for exponential families. Uh, we can talk about this one when we actually have a sum of one. Basically, there are different ways of writing it. And to be honest, like minus gradient of log and g um, is a bit of a mouthful. Uh, if we write it slightly differently, the, this expression will look slightly nicer and hopefully better, to, like easier to manipulate. So this is pretty much it. Um, Right, so uh, let me first answer some questions. Uh, right, the U's are also normal rather than orthogonal. So orthonormal is a bit more than also orthogonal because they are uninorm. Thank you for that, uh, Charlie. Uh, that is yeah, the only new question I saw. So a few concluding notes, right, as we like touch the technical meat of this um, Class. It's worth clarifying that the lecture notes are not designed designed to be reading material. It's more like a, how I guide you through the material that I think are important. Um, and I tell the story. I don't write the story on the slide. If you want reading material, the book is great. I can tell you. Um, and I'm not producing new equations. If you expect shiny new PPs, um, then uh, I won't deliver it. Um, so let's just discuss about the toy data, the sinusoid, CD regression data that we've been look, looking at. Um, the meta point I'm trying to make is that, yes, a lot of people and probably a lot of you are working with really complex models and really large data sets. But the ability to reason about machine learning models on really small toy data is a core skill that allow you to, to debug and, res, uh, and essentially diagnose why things don't work or how to improve models. Um, it is a core skill, for example, for the machine learning PhD students in my lab. So one of the first questions we almost always ask is, oh, you have this shiny new model. What is the toy data that best, that your model will best predict? Answering that is usually not easy, it requires some thinking and yeah, um, some practical work as well. So, right, so that, that's the second point. Designing a pro appropriate toy data is a core research skill in machine learning and engineering. If you're doing a, for example, honor project or master's research project, you will probably end up doing this. Within this class, we I don't think we ask you to people to do it so far because a lot of answers to these kind of questions are not like they can't be done in a few hours or a few minutes if it's an exam. All right. But maybe this this year I will find a way to slip one of these questions into an exam. OK, so we've talked about curve fitting maximum likelihood and a lot of machine learning concepts that will reoccur again. I hope this also gives people a reasonable teaser if you're still deciding whether you are taking or dropping this class. Um, and we, we did a fairly extensive review of concepts in probability derivatives um, 
and eigenvalues, eigenvectors, and so on. And I hope some of you, at least some of you, find it helpful. Uh, with a class size as large as this, it's hard to cater to everybody's abilities. Uh, we try. Um, OK, thanks for everyone for the Piazza discussion so far. I think um, Piazza has been very active more than last year. And I hope, uh, I'm sure other people find the technical discussions informative as well. Um, so that's all for today. Let me stop the recording. Okay, thanks for the thumbs up and I will see hopefully a lot of you Monday noon. Oh, what is 